It's unbelievable. Well, I was reading a little bit about it preparing for this, and, and I didn't realize that, that one thing they did was when they finished the design, they decided to add another 3,200 seats up top, but right. what they didn't do was ra they did not raise the roof more than they had planned to. So they said that that wound up made, making the building a lot louder uh -huh. than it would have been otherwise because they kind of kept the original design while still adding seats. So, so it, it, Well, I tell you, no place got louder than Barnhill. Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. It's hard, it was hard to beat Barnhill. But Barn half Hill. as many people. Oh, man. It yeah. was something else. Always a lot of fun there. Okay, you good? Yeah. All right. Well, Coach, thank you so much for being willing to sit down with us. Um, it seems impossible to believe that it has been 30 years since the championship season. I think for those of us who are fans, that year was kind of the pinnacle of, of our fandom, um, if you will. But a as you look back on that season, what does it represent to you? Well, y as you said, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, every coach dreams of, of, of winning a national championship. And every coach, probably the, the goal as, as, at, at one point in their career is to win a national championship. And for us to be able to get that done, you know, it's, it's very hard to even explain how, how good you feel inside that you were able to have your kids, assistant coaches and fans and everybody pitch in to help you get to the pinnacle of the game of basketball. No doubt. Before we get into 1994, I just wanted to go back in time a little bit with you. Um, why did you want to become a basketball coach? Well, it's funny you ask. I've talked doing a memoir a little bit of, of my life. I think at the age of 10 years of age, I was a bigger kid that lived in a Hispanic neighborhood. So I was, instead of them thinking I was uh, 10, they thought I was 13 or 14 because I was a lot taller. I played on a baseball team and there were times they wouldn't let me play because of because they thought I was 15, 14 years of age. You couldn't be that age. I was only 10. So the, the, there were some games I got to play and some games I got to coach. In other words, they put me on the third base uh, line or the first base line. I gave signals and everything. So I enjoyed that more than I enjoyed playing the baseball game. It, it didn't bother me that I didn't get to play because then I was being able to help coach the team. But I was like 10 years of age. and. I didn't know that that was going to stick with me, but I found myself uh, at, at a very early age running, trying to draw up plays of football plays and baseball and basketball plays and stuff of that nature. And so I, uh, I thought from that point, uh, that's what I want to do. I want to be, I want to be able to coach. So I, I, I was long way, you know, know what I wanted to do. And, and really wanted to do is to be able to coach. Was there something about the, the, the aspect of leadership that appealed to you at a young age? Well, I didn't know anything about leadership at that age. Uh, uh, all I knew is that I, when you love something, as my grandmother would say, if you love something so much that you're willing to not even take pay to do it, then you got something that's very attractive. You, you're not dissatisfied when you go to work. When you go to work because you're happy that you're going to work, and I, and I was very happy, so, so I, I never thought about leadership or anything of that nature. You mentioned your grandmother. I know that your mother died when you were very young. Your father passed away a few years later, and so it was your grandmother who had a tremendous role raising you and your siblings as well. I know that Coach Haskins later on at Texas Western also had a huge influence on you. When you went on to become a coach in your own right, were there certain lessons, or maybe what were the certain lessons that those two especially had made on you that you then applied to become a, a successful coach in your own right? Well, I, I think there's many lessons that I learned, especially from my grandmother. You know, I. I I would tell anyone that most kids have heroes and people that they look up to, 
Well, my hero was my grandmother, you know. Back in the day, Jackie Robinson was an African-American baseball player that broke the barrier, the barrier line to, to be the first. And she would always say that, you know, there's going to be some changes, hopefully, but Jackie Robinson has created a lot. So you guys got to go out and try to prove yourself that he was right about giving you the opportunity. That, that was uh, a lesson that I, I heard over and over again from my grandmother. I think with Coach Haskins, uh, of course, at that time, I'm a grown man on, and, and it was a college player. Uh, uh, when he came, I was the leading scorer on, on the Texas Western basketball team. But in those days, there were only one African-American on, on the entire squad, and that, that was me. And so more places that I uh, ended up going, learning things, was the, the, the thing that I think helped me become, as, uh, to me, a successful coach in most cases because of our, the, you, might, you know, my winning percentage. But I think it all comes from what Granny taught and what Coach Haskins had to say. And then there's other people that are involved with helping my career or helping me become successful. So you started coaching at Bowie High School, then you moved on to junior college, then to the University of Tulsa. During that journey, at what point did the University of Arkansas basketball program kind of first come on your radar? Not so much when you were hired, but when did you first notice the Razorbacks and who they were and, and maybe thought, well, that might be a good place to work one day? We had a, I was a high school coach also. I started in the seventh grade. and I never forget there was a, our football coach was a Razorback, Don Riddier. He was, uh, he played up here under a different, I can't, it wasn't under uh, Brawls, it was way before him. It's probably under Barnhill that he played under. And he would, he would, uh, uh, it, it was funny, I, I knew the, the pick suey call way before I ever came or any, even hit the, uh, walk, entered the state of Arkansas. Because on, on Saturdays or Saturday afternoon, he would say, hey, coach, come here. Now listen, if you listen real careful, you'll hear him calling the hogs. And I said, calling the hogs? Yeah, they're going to call the hogs. I said, you know, he said, you, you know how they call them? No. And then he, he gets with this chant. So there I was, years and years later, ending up at a place where the guy that was my high school uh, tutor and coach, was an Arkansas uh, uh, person. So that's when I first uh, noticed the Arkansas. Once I came to Tulsa University, I came over to watch Tulsa play the Razorbacks, football, but I was their basketball coach. And I would never forget my daughter that passed away. She was so intrigued with the, at the stadium with the calling of the Hogs. So on our way back home driving, she was practicing in the back seat. Woo! I said, wait a minute. <laughs> she said, did you? No, no idea at that time. You know, I was just, I just gotten a coaching job at Tulsa. Then four or five years later, I become the Suey Pig basketball coach. Unbelievable. That well, is. That's a great story. So it was 1985. 1985. That, call, that call comes from Frank Rose. You're offered the job at Arkansas. I remember watching as a kid your introductory news conference, and, and you told uh, everyone there that your goal was to win the big one. And right. we all knew exactly what you meant by that. Why were you so optimistic, even on that first day, that you could accomplish the biggest goal of all at the University of Arkansas? Well, I felt good because everywhere I've already had gone, I won. And so if you stop and think, uh, you know, I took a little school at Bowie High School, not a player over six feet tall, and start winning 30 games a season and got into the Elite Eight and no one has ever heard of a little. And Texas is huge to get that far. 
And then I, I get the junior college job. And in three years, I win the national championship, which is what I went there for, won a national championship in three years, and go undefeated in the last year when we go 37-0. I get the Tulsa job. I get the Tulsa job, and then in the first year, first head coach, we win the NIT national championship. And in those days, it was 48 teams that got to go to the NCAA. 49, all these teams now, we didn't, we didn't have that many of them. So, so we will go there and win. I'm, now I'm coming to Arkansas. Well, what's going to stop me from thinking that I can't win a national championship at the place that I thought I could win one? And, and that, that was what it was all about. I, 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 I didn't back off of the fact that that's what my goal was. Because when I came into the, to the, to the to basketball, that was the goal. And the only thing that bothered me more than anything is that I should have won it three, four times. Especially the last one, at least. You know, Chris, if, if you would go back and see that we won 11 straight NCAA games. In other words, six to win a national championship. We were one game for going back to back and undefeated in NCAA of a two year period. I mean, it, 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 it's there. I mean, it, the, the numbers are there of what happened. So I, I felt very confident that, that we could eventually one day win a national championship. That belief in yourself was well founded. I know the first couple of years though at Arkansas were tough. They were tough on the court. They were especially tough off the court with the loss of Yvonne, uh, which you mentioned. When you think about those couple of years, Coach, when you reflect af after all this time, how, how difficult of a time was that for you worst, and your wife to have gone through? Worst time of my life. Worst. I hated basketball. Uh, it it, it kind of took me away from what I, I needed to, to, to do. I know we were... You know, the war in the newspaper, and I was, I thought I sold newspapers instead of trying to win basketball games. They, let's buy a paper to see what Nolan's going to do, when they're going to fire him, and what have you. So we went through that period, and at the same time, I'm, I'm losing a daughter. Uh, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I mean, the first two years were just, it was, it was a very, very difficult time, and my, the wife was really, really distorted uh, going through those times. And I think because of her, uh, I almost decided that I didn't want to co coach anymore. I was going to finish up my master's degree and, and become a principal, uh, wanted to be an uh, principal of, a, of an elementary school where you catch them young and teach them the right ways. But... Uh, she, when she, she, she left, it, it kind of, I renewed my vow to the game of basketball. I think I started work twice as hard, uh, tried to get better recruiting. My assistants were better. My players got better as the times went on. And then we started pumping wins into the program. There's no doubt about that, because by 1988, uh, you're back in the NCAA tournament. Uh, as you said, you're winning Southwest Conference championships, you're winning Southwest Conference tournaments, and then by 1990, you're in the Final Four. Um, how would you describe that stretch of time, that first burst of success that you had in Fayetteville? I, I, I needed that really bad because of the early years just getting started here. So in 85, getting here and 90 going to the Final Four, was, that, that was tremendous because now I think I'm close enough with the kind of players that I were bringing in that I, I have a legitimate chance of being one of those teams that you say, Arkansas, or just pencil them in. They're in the Final Four, or the Elite Eight for sure. But uh, uh, I, you know, again, I, uh, you know, I, I was thinking of, of just in five-year period, 
the five year period, uh, it just looked like it just popped out there. And before you know it, you know, we were off and running. And, and, and you know, being, being the kind of team that, uh, that had a chance to go to the Final Fours. And at first, we, you know, they, they had only, well, there had been more than one, but Coach Sutton had taken them to a Final Four. So at least we've gotten to that point of stage of the game. And then after that, boy, it, we, we, I thought we had a chance to win some more. On, a, on an annual basis, actually, it yeah. seems. W one of the real challenges of coaching, and especially in the college ranks, is kind of reloading talent year after year. Um, after the day Mayberry and Miller team kind of moved on, uh, you ushered in what turned out to be um, your best squad, your championship winning squad. I, I wanted to ask you about some of the guys that you brought in individually and just what you thought of them as you were bringing them into the program, what you thought they, they were at that time and what they would become. Let's start with Corliss Williamson. Big nasty. Oh, I remember meeting him as a 14, 13 year old little boy at a gas station there in Little Rock. They were up there and I was up there watching some kids play. But anyway, Big Nasty uh, impressed me when I saw him on television as an eighth grader, I suppose, dunking the basketball and, and, and tearing down the rim. I said, we got guys that have been trying to tear a rim down and <laughs> didn't even come close to it. But he, he was, he was a, a guy that, you know, he had played AAU and they were good. Uh, uh, Gatorade Player of the Year. I mean, he, he was by far the best player, you know, that, uh, that had come, was coming out of Arkansas, particularly that, that year. And I, we were so proud of the fact that he, he didn't go visit any other school. He knew where he wanted to go to school. He knew who he wanted to play for. So uh, I had a wonderful time for three years with uh, Big Nasty. And it's amazing he could have had another year and we could have had another chance of being a Final Four team. Uh, another big man was Darnell Robinson. Darnell, I got out of California. His father, I, and it's a funny story because his grandfather was a friend of mine, but I didn't know Darnell was, his, was his, uh, related to him. And what happened was one day I was in Tulsa and I stopped at the gas station where he, he uh, Darnell's grandfather kind of ran it. And, and he says to me, he says, hey coach, have you ever heard of my son, or my grandson? I said, I don't know, what's his name? He said, Darnell Robinson. I said, Darnell Robinson is your, that's my grandson. I said, well then that means that he's got to come to school in Arkansas there. He said, it might be possible coach. And that's how big Darnell. So I go to see him play, and he's six ten or so, and he's playing all these little bitty guys. And so I figure, well, it's going to take him a while to uh, adjust to playing guys of his size because he was so much bigger than the guys in the league that he was in. He was averaging like 30, 35 points a game. But uh, he had the potential of being one of the best big men because he could dribble, he could pass. He could shoot the ball pretty good, and, uh, and he had the size. Uh, so uh, he fitted in perfectly. We needed size. Uh, you also got size from a young man named Lee Wilson. Lee. Lee got him out of Waco. Uh, I'm, I was more familiar with Lee's because I'm, since I was coaching high school in Texas and junior college in Texas, Waco was a, one of the junior college places that we'd go and play in. So, uh, it, he, Lee was a, a very interesting recruit because he really, uh, when he visited us, it sound, seemed like it was over with, that this is where it was coming. And, uh, and, I, and of course, he liked the possibility of us going further. And, uh, and he was able to go take, uh, be on a team that took us all the way. And so him, him and Robinson made us have some size, even though they didn't start. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, one of your starters who made a huge impact was Scotty Thurman. Well, Scotty was the man. The people don't know how good Scotty was. Scotty was, Scotty, you know, was probably 
one of the one of the best players I've ever coached, be, and, and and he wasn't the most athletic, but he was very gifted, very very knowledgeable of the game, which I would say could see the game through his eyes, the way he played, and the way you let him play. He was the, he was really good, and and I I saw that at the at the AAU. Uh, games that he played in, I saw him in the summer. He he never changed. You know, he's he's kind of like a Lee Mayberry, uh, which was a guy you couldn't tell whether he's behind twenty or up twenty. He didn't change expression. He just stayed and played, mm -hmm. stayed and played. And so he was he was a delightful player to and, and never gave you any problems. Fantastic. Uh, Clint McDaniel, one of your starting guards. Man, he was he was he was a he was a scoring player from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, as a kid, I watched him play when I was the coach over there, and he watched my teams play at Tulsa. So uh, one while, uh, you know, it was it was automatic where he was going to come and play for me. But then they talked him into maybe changing his mind. I had to go over and say, Hey, you already made your mind up. Yeah, I'm just playing, Coach. No, you're not playing. You got to get over here. We need you. He went from a leading scorer in, in, in Oklahoma, Tulsa area, to a defensive demon. And and I never forget that he wasn't playing very much. And he said, "Could he meet with me and find out what's the reason?" I said, "You don't play defense. If you play some more defense, you'll probably be one of the guys that be starting." But uh, if you can't, if you can't guard nobody, I got a picture of him guarding a guy over here. Uh, that he, and he won't even let him see. I mean, he put his hand. It's a foul. But I told him, you know, you're quick enough that you can play ping pong by yourself, man. So let's start using it. And he did. Uh, I had, like I said, I had some very good people Indeed. on that team. His backcourt mate was Corey Beck. Oh, Corey is it was a, it's like the head the head of the snake. If if you cut his head off, then the body dies. So he did more than just be the leader on the floor. Because I always thought all of our guys were leaders, but he he was the guy that it, that pushed the buttons and the right buttons he he could push and he could talk. Uh, he was the vocal leader or. Where, like I would mention, you have a silent leader, which was like Lee Mayberry, and then you got the guy that's vocal who will tell you how he feels and what needs to be done, and then he goes out and get it and perform it. And so, uh, there's Corey was was one of the toughest kids I've ever coached. I, I read a great story about the first time you ever saw him play. You remember? That? Can you tell me that story? It's um, uh, I, uh, go ahead. That, well, that he was diving on the floor for loose balls and that and that afterwards you said that they lost the game but you saw him with tears in his eyes oh and yeah then you knew he was a he was a real competitor well when i saw that uh yeah uh, you know he was he was a guy that i reminded me of who who i was with as a player uh wanting to win at all costs whether you whether you had to dive on the floor take the charge. He took 52 charges one year, that year. 52, I believe. That means he sacrifices about it 52 times, and then I go back to to, to the little guard. What's his <laughs> My little guard, Alex Dillard. He took one. He took one charge in the entire season. So giving up the body, if that meant win, Beck was your man. Well, you mentioned Alex Dillard. He didn't take a lot of charges, but he took a lot of threes. Oh, did he? And he had a very interesting backstory as well. Well, you know, he, he didn't he didn't even make his high school team. He, you know, he was he, he we found him in a junior college where nobody even knew that there's a guy that shoots thirty feet out all the time. Uh, I never forget uh, the first time I saw him in, as a, in a team game. He took about a 50-foot jump shot, and he missed it. 
and I, and I, and I, I got a guy in for him. And as he came through, I said, well, what, what are you doing shooting the ball out that far? He said, coach, I was open. <laughs> I said, I'll leave you open all night too if you're going to shoot from there. I said, Ronnie, I put him back in the game. He takes as soon as he goes out. It's like he had amnesia. He shoots a, maybe a 55-footer, but he makes it. So I said, well, okay. And he goes back again, and he shoots another one, and he makes it. So I'm saying, no, no, Alan, no. I'm, he's getting ready to shoot another one, and I'm yelling, no. And the ball just shoo. Nice shot, son. <laughs> I said, so I gave him green light. Go, go. When you think you can score, shoot it. And now that's such a regular part of the game. Oh, he was kind of the forerunner of the Stephen Currys and the Trey Youngs. It's, it's yes, amazing, yeah. yes. Uh, a, a young man who I know was very special to you, who lived with you for a while, was Dabo Remax. Dabo Remax. Dabo and I had many conversations about how he played. It's an interesting story because his, one of my players had played for his father over in, in, in Argentina. Uh, uh, Switzerland, maybe? Well, Austria? Uh, Austria. Uh, Austria. Okay. His, his, uh, his father was a coach. That was father was a pro coach. Mm -hmm. And he had a, a brother that was better than Davo, about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, but Davo could shoot the basketball. And, and uh, he played out. He, he, when he came, he, he stayed with us, and he, and he played there at Fayetteville High School. Not in Davo, I don't think nobody really know. I think Davo was the state tennis champ in high school out of, out of here. Then, of course, if I was going to give him a scholarship, he had to live somewhere else instead of with me. And so he moved to one of the, the kids that it was his best friend's house and spent the rest of the year uh, season. Then he came here, spent five years on the campus and was really a key player at many cases, I mean, you know, we needed something to happen. Dabo would come in and maybe hit you two or three shots and guard somebody and he had good hands. So he was a very, uh, all of our guys seemed to fit the puzzle of what we tried to do. Let me ask you one more piece of that puzzle and that's Dwight Stewart. Big man, they call him the big dog. Dwight, Dwight had the greatest assist that's ever, uh, nobody, they talk about the shot. Boy, but he's got to get the ball to him to get the shot. And Dwight did that with his presence of mind, uh, uh, bobbling it and throwing it. But I, when I got Dwight, I thought I was getting another big O. But Dwight could not play with his butt back to the basket. And, and then that's big O's was, was very good at his back to the basket and front to the basket. But, uh, but now big Dwight could shoot the rock as good as any big kid could shoot it. And, so it became a matchup problem for a lot of people to guard us when they had a guy like him that could shoot it out on, on the perimeter, that could pass. So I could do everything. Uh, he's very smooth. And, and, and like I said, they, they just kind of mashed. Everybody kind of put pieces together. And Dwight was doing that at a time when big men weren't really shooters. He, to me, was a, a prototypical stretch five, which now is all over um, the NBA. He, he was also 300 pounds in high school. Was he kind of overlooked by a lot yeah, of people? Yeah, I, I think they did. Even, you know, we, we got on to Dwight late. I watched him. He, he, and, he and Beck played all the way through junior high, high school together. They, and they were really close. And they went to school together. And so D Dwight uh, was, was a heavy kid, really, really heavy, just like Big O. But Big O wasn't quite as heavy as he was in high school because Big O weighed him like 250 in high school, whereas Dwight was pretty rare, close, like line of three. He went to junior college for one year. Then they transferred and redshirted. And that's, and that's another thing. We were able to redshirt some of our guys and it gave us a little bit of age when they came to play. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing today. They go around, you know, now, now you can recruit off a of campus, right. get you some players, get you three or four players from each one of the campuses, and you're ready to go. <laughs> that's, that, that's the beauty of age, it's experience. 
that's what I call uh, that is going on today. So you recruited this group when you got them together on campus. Did you know that 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 could be the group that could help you win it all? I didn't. I didn't think that way. Uh, I, I knew that if we we take care of business and 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 keep and, and you know put ourselves in a position that we'd have a chance to go all the way. Uh, you, you know, being around the game as long as I had and had the opportunity to, to, to have finished and win some championships, I felt like uh, our, that group was pretty good. Now, whether we get it all was, a, was a, if the, wherever the cookie crumbles, but we had a chance. And, and to go back to the old granny, it, all they got to do is crack the door and you kick it down and once they get your foot inside. And that's, that's kind of what we did with our basketball team. When we, we found the little crack and we'd do whatever we could possibly be, do to get in. Do you want to take a little break? Are you doing okay? I'm fine. Are you good? Okay. Dog okay? Uh, yeah. You want me to get him to, to take him? Well, to does he no, need to? Him. I mean, we yeah, could... It doesn't, does it bother you guys? You think it's okay? Okay, as okay. long as you're all right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the term you just used, breaking down doors, um, that was a phrase you used, uh, sledgehammer, right. street fights, to right. describe your game and, and your approach. Is that how you wanted to prepare your guys? That's that, it. That they had to go to battle. Yeah. You, you, in other words, as you named them. Well, it was nothing for me to call time on. I said, okay, guys, we got to get in a street fight with these guys. Street fight is, you got boxers, they throw punches, you know, left, left, right, jabs, jabs, this. A street fighter, whatever you find, you can get hit. So which one would you rather be? The guy that's a street fighter or a guy that's got to wait for the right punch to punch somebody? I'd rather, for the, I'd rather to go after with everything I got. That's a street fighter. Then the next, <clears throat> once... Once you get, uh, my grandmother would say, you, you approach an ant, get you a sludge hammer. When you put him out, he is out. That's, that's how we want to appear. We want to, in the last five to eight minutes of a game, you want to look over to your guys that you've been playing and guarding and see if they're holding on to their shorts. And if they are, you got them. That's what you call the, uh, there was one other word there that we, we would call uh, when you reach a when you reach a point and they don't want no more. Breaking point. Breaking point. That's it. Every game has a breaking point, and when we, if we get to that breaking point, that's when you break them. You know, and that's that's runs. You know, like fourteen to one run. At the, because, see, your runs are based on, that's why I say the fans are so important. They, you keep them in the game, and they help you just pump, pump, pump. If you can get your runs to go longer than the opponent's runs, you're going to beat them. So. I want to talk about those games um, in, in 1994, but I, I guess to, to do that in a game, you first have to do it in practice. I saw a quote from Darnell Robinson he said that Arkansas basketball is on another level. Each practice is as hard as my toughest high school game. That was by design from you, I'm sure. Absolutely. Uh, we, we worked so hard. Uh, I, I pushed our guys to the limit because I knew that when you get into a game, when you get into a game, you start. Uh, I use Vince Lombardi's vision when he said fatigue will make cowards of us all fatigue will make you a coward and that's what we're trying to do is make them cowards because of the work that we're putting in we're constantly no one outworks the Razorbacks no 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 individual no team can outwork us we might be smarter I says take for example at the university there's uh, professors up there got more degrees than thermometers. But none of them can outwork me. And that's what I want to base 
this on. I want to base, base it on the fact that we outwork everyone. No doubt. The results showed it. Okay, so to open the season in 1993 and 1994, you also opened Bud Walton Arena, um, which we talked about. Can you describe your reaction when you first walked into that building? Well, you know, I watched it go up, so it looked like I saw it every day. And then to me at that time, it looked like it wasn't moving. <laughs> How about with fans? <laughs> no. When I saw it with the fans, well, when they said that it was ready, that we we're going to try to play in it that, that coming this coming uh, games and stuff, but the excitement was there, boy. And, uh, you know, we played, it seemed to me we played another team, but we, we listed Missouri as our opening game. And we were still so fired up from the first game that poor Missouri, that, that, that is a game that I can never describe to anyone and make sense. You know, I get a kick out of them and said, you got our rebound. Yeah, but we won by 52. Ooh. Stats, I try to make people understand. Stats don't tell the story. The stats, stats can, can tell you what you did statistically, but the stats don't know nothing about your heart, diving on the floor, you know, uh, scraping up your elbows, uh, uh, you, you know, how many slam dunks cause the fans to get more excited, to give you more. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a lot more than, than, than that goes to the game than just a stat, stat sheet, you know. So, but uh, watching that game and being in that new facility, you know, we went undefeated that year, never didn't lose a game in the, in the building. That, that, that was all just, uh, you, couldn't have, you couldn't have wrote a better script than, than what happened that year with uh, Razorback basketball in a new arena. Your memory is very good. Uh, you opened November 29th against Murray State. Yes, Scott, Scott, Edgar, Scott Edgar was the assistant coach. Um, after the game, Clint McDaniel said, if Barnhill Noise is a 10, this is about a 20. <laughs> that night, boy, it was about 25, 30, boy, because they, the fans came from there far near everywhere, you know, just First of all, to see the new beautiful facility that the university has gotten on its campus and basketball has, to me, has really arrived to, a, to an all-time level of being able to, to have more of its fans to come in and watch the Razorbacks play. So a couple of days later, December 2nd, was the dedication game, as you mentioned, kind of the formal unveiling when you beat uh, Missouri 120 to 68. Um, and that was no scrub team. They went on to win their con the Big Ten championship. Undefeated. At the time. So what was, what did you sense was happening during that game? <laughs> was that, did you, did you at that point say, okay, we're well, good? I got a kick out of Norm Stewart. Norm's a, a dry guy and I got to know him pretty well. He comes over to me after the game is over he says, and in, in his voice, Nolan. I said, yeah, coach. I said, man, we, I don't know what happened. We, we were, he said, you're either damn good or we're damn bad. <laughs> I said, coach, it'll never, ever happen in my career again. That, it didn't matter who I put in the game. They were making shots. You know, uh, Al Dillard was shooting them from 40, 50 feet out. Uh, guys who I thought couldn't shoot was knocking them down deadly. Uh, and... You know, it, it was one of those occasions. And, and we're opening a new gym, and a new facility, and all the fans are so excited. It was a perfect storm. And nothing you did was right, nothing. I mean, they couldn't hardly bring it down the floor. So it, 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 I'll never forget that game. Uh, a few nights later, December 4th, uh, 111 to 76 over Northwestern State. Uh, Alex Hillard scored 16 points in a minute and 53 seconds. <laughs> um, two days later, Coach, uh, the Arkansas Razorbacks topped the Associated Press poll number one uh, for the first time since 1978. And, and then they only held it for one, one week with Eddie Sutton. What did that mean to you to have the number one team in the country? Oh, I wanted it bad because I thought we had the team that could support that number one I think we held it for about 12 weeks. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how many weeks, nine or 12. 
but it was a period that you, if you held it that long, you, you're pretty good. And I thought, uh, uh, that, you know, w w I'd look to see where we're ranked. Uh, t today's, uh, I don't know if the rankings is, is as important, but back in those days, you, you know, you, the higher you rank, the more chances of getting television games and stuff of that nature. And we, we became a team that other, not only the Razorbacks like to watch, but other t places around the country would say, hey, boy, I like to watch your team play. They, they, they're a lot of fun to watch. And, and that's what I wanted a team that everybody wanted to watch play. To start the year, uh, you were outscoring your first five opponents by almost 38 points a game, but then you had a little adversity with some injuries to both Lee Wilson and Darnell Robinson in late December. Um, on December 23rd, you went to Tulsa, where you coached for several years uh, to play the Hurricane in what turned out to be a, a great game. Uh, Corliss Williamson had a little baseline hook uh, with three seconds left to win that game, 93 to 91. Do you have, have any specific memories of that particular contest? Oh, that was a scary tight deal because I'm, I'm going back to Tulsa. They're, 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 those kids played their hearts out of at Tulsa. And we played as good. We played pretty good, but but uh, they they really played well. Uh, uh, you know, and that same that's the same year that uh, we get to play them again. In the NCAA tournament, that same I believe that same year, That's correct. and we win by by 19, but it, that more or less the way we probably should have thought we should have when we played them at Tulsa. Was it emotional for you playing Tulsa? After yeah, that? it was because I'd spent five wonderful years over there, and uh, uh, they were already talking about building a new facility. Uh, we we went from not. You know, the, all five years I was there, I attended a tournament. I attended two NITs and 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 three NCAAs, and and they had never been to I think just one one in fifty five years. So it was a so it was a brand new deal for the Tulsa. It was brand new for me. Uh, I had no clue what we were doing. All I knew is that I wanted to try to win. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Razorbacks' first loss was at Alabama on January 8th. And Dwight Stewart kind of missed a layup toward the end. Um, the next game, Mississippi State, Clint McDaniel separated or dislocated his shoulder. He lost by a point. Losing two games, which were, turned out to be the only two games you lose all year. Was that tough on the team? Did it, did it, did it cause any doubt to creep in? about who they were? No, no, I don't think so. You know, we, both games could have been won. When, when, you, when you play and, and you play to win, in other words, uh, when, you, when, when, when you play and you lose a point or two points, that means that one play, you're one play away from winning. And, and, and even with all the adversity, we were still just one play away from, from winning those ball games. So, you know, you, you use that as an incentive to just say it can happen. We call it the snake bitters. One day the snake will turn and bite them. So in the meantime, we got to keep trying to you know, keep our heads straight enough where we can, uh, we can face any challenge. Okay, let me ask you about two more regular season games. Um, January 29th in Knoxville, uh, in what a lot of people call the biggest shot of the regular season, Scotty Thurman hit a three with nine seconds to play for a 65-64 win. That was a, I remember that, that was a big win for the Razorbacks. That was big for us because yeah. we couldn't win in Tennessee very much at all. Uh, Scotty, you know, they, over Scotty's career he had seven chances of, Winning ball games, taking the last shot, he made all seven. Taken over his career, it's, it's incredible. You know they had, they talk about the shot that he made for the national championship. Yeah, that was just one of six more that he was able to knock down. 
But that was a big win for us, you know, because one year, it's, it seemed to me that we, we, we beat Kentucky and our next game was Tennessee. And I figured that we beat Kentucky on the road, now we got to go to Tennessee and we can beat them. You know, we got a chance to be pretty close to undefeated kind of a season. But we lost to Tennessee at their place. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly what year it was, but, but that happened also. Tennessee was always a tough place to play. Right. And so was Kentucky. Um, yeah. The year you mentioned, I think, might have been 90 or 91. Um, but the, the Razorbacks went to uh, Lexington February 9th, second ranked in the country. Kentucky was fourth ranked in the country. They had won 33 straight games mm -hmm. at Rupp Arena. Uh, they jumped out to a 15-point lead on you guys. Um, but there was a technical called on Roderick Rhodes from Kentucky, which sparked an 8 nothing run, and the Razorbacks went on to win 90-82. to It was only Rick Pitino's second home conference loss uh, since he had been at Kentucky. I, what a great coach he was and is. I know you loved every chance you had to beat him, especially at his place, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, not only him, it would have been anyone at Kentucky. Uh, we, you know, Kentucky became the flagship team of the league because they'd won more national championships. They, you know, they were basketball when, when nobody else was in the in Southeast Conference basketball. So they've always had the tradition. Uh, Rupp Arena is, 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 is big, uh, you know. So when you go in there and can win and against a good Kentucky team, you know, you've done something. And for us to come from 15 behind on a strange court, that's incredible for us to be able to do that. And so, uh, yeah, there's no question. I, I, that was one of my favorite all-time wins, is to uh, knock off Kentucky at Kentucky after being behind. Uh, so you went on to uh, spend nine weeks at number one. You finished the season with wins over Alabama, LSU, and Mississippi State. A 24-2 and two record, averaging 91 points a game, an average margin of victory of 22 points per game. By the time you reached the end of the regular season, were you then thinking, this is going to be the team that wins a championship? The... the, the I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, in 94, when we got beat, I guess, by Kentucky, wasn't it? In the SEC in tournament? The tournament. Correct. Yes, yeah. That was, a, that was a big blow, but it was an eye-opener at the same time. Uh, so when we, when we left for the NCAA coming up, to me, we refocused because we had just gotten beat and we shouldn't have. You know, we had a chance, but Cor Corliss fouled out and uh, McDaniels. Every, things that, you know, we were there to, to take that was our first, going to be our first SEC championship uh, tournament-wise. And, and, and we have done everything else. We won divisions. We had won the SEC. This was a chance for us to, to have our second one. That one I thought was going to flatten us going into the NCAA. But we rejuvenated, looked like it, after we got past the first game. Because that first game wasn't that, wasn't that easy. That first game was North Carolina A&T. Razorbacks were the number one seed in the Midwest region. You were playing in Oklahoma City. Um, people describe the, the team as kind of lifeless in that game. What were your what were your thoughts walking away? With nine minutes to go, we only had a four point lead. Well, I think during the year we played them. You might look that up. We played them here. Matter of fact, I think President Clinton came to the game. Beat them by forty, I think thirty five, forty points. It was a blowout. So now we're going to play them the first round, and our guys are saying, "Oh, <laughs> you know, this is a twenty five point." Victory, I could tell because I would, I could tell that the, 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 it wasn't like they were something was urgent getting ready to happen. 
they don't realize that the first round games, anything can happen in the first round games. And as you get, as you get into the tournament, you get the moving the, a lot better. So anyway, to me, that was, that was the only time that I felt like I don't know what, what's going to happen. We lose here and we go here and we're flat. Well, we got out of that, getting out of that flatness was the same thing that happened to us in the 95 championship. We, we, we're, we're not playing really good, but we flat. We just couldn't, you know, uh, I don't think, uh, I don't know if fans or people realized that my team's scoring was based on our defense, turnovers. A lot of our scoring was based on that. We, we get 20% from our 50% uh, from our offense, but we got most of everything else from our defense. Mm -hmm. And so when, it, when it's lacking, everything is lacking. Um, real quick, you mentioned President Clinton, which yeah. I, I did want to ask about earlier. Uh, he appeared at a couple of regular season games and then postseason games, always came in and talked with you at the term. Well, what did it mean to have him as a part of this journey in this. In oh, this I was, that was great because he, you know, he, he's truly loved the Razorbacks. You know, I, I matter of fact, I see him out running, jogging with the big Razorback hog on and, but he had really thoroughly enjoyed the games. I, I you know, when he, uh, as we walked uh, off the court, I was visiting with him and, and I'm not uh, Rose told me, you ain't supposed to put your arms around the president. I said, he wasn't the president right then. <laughs> he's a fan. He's, yeah, he's my friend. He's my, you know, my buddy. And uh, I, I, he, I never forget what he, he said. I've been waiting for all my life for this, this moment. And I said, well, I'm glad we got it. So we went into the dressing room, and I took him in there with the, where the players were. And uh, it, it was uh, just a great feeling to say, finally, fellas, we are national champions. Great indeed. Well, let's go back just a little bit to the, the second round game was Georgetown. John Thompson, I yeah. know someone who you, you know and respect well. Um, that was a back and forth game. Um, tell me a little bit about that, what you remember about the Georgetown game. Oh, man. Well, they were they were really good. Scotty uh, Thurman got ejected from that game. Right? Yes, he did. Yes. And, and he wasn't the one that started it. He was just going out to try to, and the guy that that should should have been ejected was Clinton McDaniel. He's the one that done all the kicking and running and throwing a punch and what have you. But uh, John is to me was by far the guy that I admired so much because there wasn't very many African American coaches back in the 80s and John won the national championship in 84. His teams played so hard. I mean, they were so vicious kind of guys. Uh, and, and, I, I, and I love that in, in his style of play. Even though he had some great players and guys like Morning, you know, uh, Patrick Ewing, Matumbo, you know. <laughs> Back in the day when they had them aircraft carriers, I call them, man, you know. So he, he, he was, a, that was a big game for us to get past him, man. It's the same way with beating Michigan and minus one player of the Fab Five. Right. You know, we, uh, the, the Arkansas went through some very good basketball teams. Some very good teams. When Scotty was ejected in the second half, you wound up playing Darnell, Corliss, and Dwight together, which is not something you often did. You kind of you went big in that game. Mm -hmm. you, you feel like that's what you needed to do to well, get we past went, that. Well, we went big, played more zone, uh, made made them shoot shots because we had a pretty good rebounding ball club, uh, offensively and defensively most of the time. But but uh, to go big was to, to really kind of make them shoot some shots, make them shoot jump shots, and we got to get the boards and, and get down the floor and, and do the thing that we do best. But that was probably the reason I, I went all big. They asked you about it after the game, and you said there are many ways to skin a cat. <laughs> yes. 
That's what Granny said. You can skin a cat in many ways if you if you if you're into skinning cats. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you moved on to the Sweet 16 Dallas Reunion Arena, a place that you were very familiar with from our time in the SEC, uh, the Southwest Conference, rather. Uh, you'd won 11 straight games in that building. And we talked a little bit about this earlier, but the team that was waiting for you in the round of Sweet 16 was Tulsa, uh, your, yeah. your former team, the team that had hired you for your first Division I job, and you had played in the regular season. It was one thing to play them in the regular season. What was it like playing them in the NCAA tournament? Well, you, you were worried, but you, you know, because you, they had a good ball club, we already faced them. And uh, if we take care of business and play the, the kind of game that we're capable of playing, we should be able to come out of here with a victory. Uh, but I, 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 I feared no one, I respect everyone. And so that's what I wanted my team. You fear no one. You know, but you respect. Uh, we got away with a one-point victory. I don't, I'm not sure we'll get away with a one-point victory. We better, we, we, you know, let's 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 try to get in there and do the best job we can, and and, and try to be in control of the game, play it at our pace. I think that's the basically things that I, I thought about, things that I was hoping that we would do, and and they did. Basically, more or less, they they played a pretty solid game that game. 19 point victory, 103 to 84. Um, you advanced then to play Michigan, which, as you mentioned, had four of the uh, Fab Five. Um, one thing that was interesting about that game, though, was the morning of the game, you were named as the Naismith Coach of the Year. <laughs> what did that mean to you? And, and what did it mean to you to learn that on the same day that you have, you know, an Elite Eight game, so, uh, as big a game as that one was? You said what happened? You were named the Naismith Coach of the Year. Yeah, but the, the day of that game. The day of that game of the Michigan game, yes, sir. Yeah, but where, where was it that? Was, was uh, this was the Michigan game, right. uh, In the Elite Eight. So they announced it. What do you mean? Did I hear it? Or? What, were you Were you aware? Uh, I don't think I. I don't think I was aware of that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that happened. But regardless, you had a big game to play. Um, Juwan Howard yeah, from Michigan Howard. was awfully good yeah. uh, and he gave Corliss a, a lot of pr problems but your team made 10 three-point field goals they went on a 20 to 1 run in the half uh, and they were able to hold off a, a very good Michigan team what are your thoughts about that? oh that was that was big you know to get to the final four you got to play the fab five minus one uh, we're we're you know it's I mean, it, it doesn't get any bigger or better than than, than match up like that, you know. Uh, I, I, you know, again, I've always wanted to play the, the best teams if we could, and that was one of the better teams too. Arizona was one of the better teams. Duke was one of the. I mean, they were all the better teams, and so uh, I just was very proud of our kids. I mean, they just. They, they, they bonded together and stayed together and, and won together. That, 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 was, that was the bottom line. When you were cutting down the nets in Dallas and thinking about being on your way to your second Final Four, what were your thoughts? How proud were you of, of what you and your team had accomplished at that point? Going to that second Final Four back-to-back -back was that's 95. Yes, sir. I'm talking about 94 from, from Dallas, from the Michigan game, moving on to Charlotte. Oh, going to Charlotte. Yes, okay. Exactly. Uh, could, couldn't have felt so, so much pride and, and proud of having the opportunity to, 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 go, to, the, to go to the final four. Uh, we had gone in, in, in 90 and against Duke. And, uh, you know, uh, I'd been there before, and I was proud of that, but now I get a second chance. Our team get a second chance with different guys. I mean, it doesn't get any better than, than, than in, within a period of three years, you're back at the big dance. Uh, I, I thought, you know, again, I, I, I couldn't have felt any prouder of the players and what they had accomplished. And now all we had left was to win it. 
Uh, I felt we had an excellent chance of winning it. I really did. We had two formidable teams uh, waiting for you. Uh, Arizona, Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, to start the Final Four, Damon Stoudemire and Khalid Reeves, considered the best backcourt in America at the time. Uh, there was something before this game. The NCAA changed the time of your shoot-around by about 45 minutes, and somehow word never got to, to, to you and the team, and you only got in about eight minutes to shoot around. Um, what did you think of that, Coach? You couldn't have been happy about it. Oh, that. my God, and I, I went berserk. <laughs> I'm saying, you know, here we are, the biggest tournament in our lives, and you did. And they, they, you call a meeting, and, and I have a guy that that's all he does. His job was to go to all the meetings and report back to me. He went, they, they never gave him a time changement, you know. And so somebody dropped the ball. And uh, at that time, I could care less somebody who dropped the ball. The, the ball was dropped, and our kids are getting cheated out of 40, 50 minutes of, of practice, uh, getting pr preparation. I use my preparations all the time, you know, and so I had already thought what we were going to be doing, and I couldn't do that. Just throw a few balls, go out there and shoot a few minutes, pop, the clock's off, we, we're out of there. They got to get out of there. That, that put a, that's like a uh, saying, hey, these guys, they don't want you to win. Uh, you got to go out and prove to them. I said, I heard on television just the other day, the smartest team will win. And that was the Duke game. I said, so that's how they, that's what they think about y'all. I said, I ain't including myself. They think I'm smart. <laughs> but, but I'm not any smarter than you guys are. So let's go out and just spike some butt if we can. So and you use that as motivation then? I used it as, as a motivation. You know, you got to take, uh, Something that you thought is bad, make it turn good, make it help you. And, and I, think, I think the guys were upset that that happened. And I think they did use it as motivation. Damon Stoudemire was held to 2 of 18 shooting. Reeves was 1 of 14. Uh, an 11 to nothing run at the end of the first half. And then uh, Dwight Stewart sparked an 11 to 1 run. Um, we talked earlier where you mentioned pushing people past their breaking points. Right. And after the game, that's what you said that you all had done to the Wildcats. Yes. How did that game play out in your mind? Well, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was shocked because they couldn't. They were, you know, they were shooting. They were the two best guards, of course, that everybody was talking about. And Scott Stoudemire, I mean, I think he hit one shot at the buzzer at the begin at the end of the half, and I said, "Oh man, I can't let him start getting loose." But they, the, McDaniel and, and Beck had had other thoughts for him, and they made tough. They made him shoot tough shots, and that's all you can ask for. Uh, and they, they didn't have a good shooting night. I don't know if we had a good shooting night, but. Uh, but we played well enough to win. Uh, Cor Corliss is lined 29 points, 13 rebounds, and five assists. Uh, I think he was certainly making a statement for a, for a na nationwide audience there. Man, see, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. I, didn't, I, I wouldn't remember those figures, but Corliss doing it? Yeah, he can do that. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> so you moved on then Monday night to the big one, yeah. the national championship game against Duke. Um, you mentioned what some reporters had suggested that maybe they were the smarter team. Um, also, before that game, you showed the team a shirt, uh, a, a T-shirt that someone had printed out with an NCAA bracket that had Michigan advancing past Arkansas, even though Arkansas had, had beaten Michigan. Again, yeah. that was more motivation for your guys. That was definitely, that's respect. And that's what we talked about, not having the respect. Here we are, getting ready to, to, to go up to the, to the supreme of the house. And we're still not getting respected. So, uh, the, you know, that was a weird type game because they came, 
you know, we played close at that to the half, and then they came out of the dressing room and uh, bang, next thing you know, we're 10 down. Uh, and everything is going right until we decided that we got to get out and play the kind of basketball that I would call street fight. We got to go into the street fight now. We had modes in which I felt that our team would, could go into, you know, the, the fighting mode, the, the, the patient mode, the slow. See, the thing that I enjoyed about the teams I coached, we could play fast, we could play slow, we could play matchups, we could pick you up, press. We, could, we, we did so many things, so we were not predictable. We were never a predictable team. Most teams run the same thing over and over and over. We, we were nothing like that. We were a team that was not in the box. It's, you know, they'd have people, eight people on the floor emulating what we did with five. You know, so, and I used to tell our guys, we are prepared for everybody. Nobody is prepared for us. You, you mentioned that timeout. You, you urged the team to pass the ball more, to wear Duke down, to open up opportunities for Corliss. And over the next nine minutes, you forced nine turnovers and outscored Duke 21 to six. And, and one other stat that stood out to me about this game was you forced Duke into 23 turnovers wow. for the game. That's not something that happened a lot to Mike Krzyzewski teams. Oh. Um, Let but me you, mention this to you real quick since you said. Yes. We played Louisville who had lost, I was at Tulsa. Louisville had lost Daryl, Daryl, I can't think of Daryl's name, but he was the player of the year. Daryl Griffin? Griffin. Griffin, yeah. At my junior college, I had four that I brought with me and Mike. And we were playing then in Tulsa. They were like 2-0 and 3-0, oh, and, oh, and they come down, they're going to whoop Tulsa. The, the contract was already signed. I mean, I had nothing to do with scheduling the game. We beat Louisville. They had 34 turnovers. They never seen anything the way we played. In a 40 minute game? Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. I, and so when you told me that, I, did, I didn't know how many. 23. Uh, Duke had 23 turnovers. You know, they 13, 12 turnovers is Duke, those kind of teams in North Carolina, you know. But th th it's amazing. They, didn't, uh, they would tell me, they would tell me that I couldn't play this way because the kid, the players are too sophisticated and understand trapping and all that. So, and, and I said, the kids that used to be in high school, they got a little bit better. But the guys that used to guard them in high school got a little bit better too. So why can't we do the same thing? I did the same thing in my high school that I did in junior college, that I did in my junior college. I did it Tulsa. I did it Tulsa. Did it Arkansas. Hmm. It must change. It's just that I'm multiple. Right, right, right. Okay, let's walk through this last minute and 15 seconds of the national championship game. Uh, Grand Hill uh, hits a three to tie the game at 70. Uh, and then the Razorbacks come down um, with a possession that I think we'll all remember here for the rest of our lives. Walk us through what you remember seeing on the court. Um, on that possession. Well, you know, the clock was running down, you know, and, 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 and it's a tie ball game. And, and the thing that, that, that was so intriguing is that Scotty hits the shot. Of course, first of all, the ball is passed to, to Dwight. Dwight's a good shooter, so I wouldn't have, it wouldn't have bothered me if he took the shot. It's the open man. But he bobbled it a little bit, and so he got control of it and got it to Scotty, and he let it go. Well, right after the game, I asked Scotty, what happened if you'd have missed the shot? He said, Coach, there were 50, 40-something seconds left. I, we just got it back and scored. <laughs> we went back down there and picked it up and scored. That's how most guys would say, I don't know what we would have done, man. Woo, if he missed that. Now, Scotty, he just said, oh, we just go back and take it, I guess. <laughs> I but said, it did go in. It went in. When, when you saw it go in, you were always very stoic 
on the sidelines. You never betrayed any emotion. You were always calm. Tried to be anyway. Inside, though, what, when that <laughs> ball goes in with 50 seconds I left. Said, I, that's when I, I, the first thing I said was to myself and up, looked upstairs, thank you, Lord. And, and, and say to my, Yvonne, we got you one. We got you one. Because she said, Daddy, you can win a national championship at Arkansas. And that's, that's the first thing that came to my mind. We got you one, baby. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Yeah. What a great feeling. Um, when you look back on it all now, Coach, 30 years later, um, and again, thank you so much for doing this for us. Um, what does it all mean? You know, sometimes people will say, well, I, I had the greatest year, but something else meant more. For you, what does that 1993-1994 national champ championship season mean to you? 30 years later, one of the greatest feelings. You know, I, I always thought that each championship that I was involved in was the greatest moment of my life from a basketball standpoint. So the junior college, oh, I thought nothing was better than that. And I didn't get to celebrate it because we got snowed in and we, we, we stayed in the church that night and we bus back and the fans were, it was, they were out there in the parade type looking, but it wasn't the same. Then we go to Tulsa and you got 10,000 people 5,000 at the airport, something that's never been heard of, and you're proud of the fact that you were able to bring a national championship, whether it be NCAA or NIT, and especially with, I thought, nothing can be better than that. So now the junior college is replaced by the Tulsa. And then now I win the granddaddy of them all. Well then, it's very hard to express and feel how you could bypass the other two, and yet this is the ultimate goal that you had set since you were 10 years old. So that's the, I, I can think about that, and I think about this little old guy that learned how to do his coaching since he was 10 years old because he was looking over age. I mean, what are my chances of winning a, a national championship from where I come from and from where I had to go to get to where I'm up to this part? Seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, junior varsity, varsity, junior college, mid-majors, major, major college. I coached the national team, Panama. I, co I coached Mexican Olympic team. And look at this one, the WNBA. So when you look back at 94 and put all this around it, it's one of the greatest feelings anyone could ever have. Well, Coach, the state of Arkansas appreciate you so much I and appreciate that. we appreciate you for doing this thank you so much for looking back on this uh, very special season with us we really well, appreciate it. i appreciate you guys coming in but I, I, this is a, a very interesting interview because i've never had them this uh you know when you're going season or team the players uh, that's that's pretty good your recall on everything is amazing i have a hard time remembering things from two weeks ago and and your 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 detail your recall of detail is is very impressive, but I don't know about that. I, I know that hoping. kind of success probably sticks with you more than more than other things, but but thank you, Coach. Okay. Okay, we're perfect. All what a right. pleasure. Thank you, sir. So thank much. you, man. All thank right. you.